David Oates, how are you? I'm well, Simon. How are you? Always good to see you, my friend. <laughs> and likewise. Well, there's a question, isn't it? How are you? I mean, <laughs> where and how do we start or do we just sideswipe that completely? Uh, yeah, no, I'm fine, thanks. All, all, all fine considering. Good. Um, look, thank you very much for your time. I know how busy you are. Um, we know each other as friends now, but we met on the sales circuits and yep. sales leaderships. Um, I know who you are. Uh, maybe you could tell everyone else. Um, tell us about you, career, um, okay. that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. Happy to do that, Simon. Um, well, the first thing to note, as you'll see from the picture, um, I'm not the youngest guy you'll interview on this program. Um, I'm a career salesperson. Uh, went to university in the early 80s when we were in the middle of a recession. Um, watched hordes of my peers and friends come out of university with great degrees and end up working at Sainsbury's or not working at all because there was such big unemployment and in my second year got offered a job um, by the father of a guy I played football with um, as a trainee photocopier salesman uh, and that was it I was hooked my father was horrified because he worked in the oil industry um, what are you doing being a sales guy that's not a proper job um, don't you just sell double glazing um, sold capital equipment um as a you know literally 20 year old um and fell in love with it as a profession not least the really flash company cars we, we got paid rubbish selling photocopies but we had really nice cars so. just remind me what was a flash uh flash car then well so i had one of the first ford xr3i X, yes. xr3i's in the country which when i made some targets i then upgraded to a 2.8 injection capri yeah i'm hearing you that was those were cars those were real cars um so yeah i got a taste for that but then was lucky enough to get a job in the and i'm going to call it the it business because there wasn't a software industry that's how old i am selling mainframe hardware really young at a time when there weren't really many computer sales guys about and the bigger players were looking for people with good old-fashioned capital equipment sales experience um because in the capital equipment days selling copiers hopefully you're interested in this this was the do you want me to outline the sales process it's really simple i love this bit i love all the technology and everything that's come in recently i love when people go back to how they cut their teeth right. in sales so this was how our day our week went every week monday morning we all met in i'm from manchester we'd all meet in some northern town at a designated cafe it wasn't even coffee shops then it was a proper greasy spoon cafe we'd all have a big fry up and then we'd be put at the top of wigan high street and we had to collect 50 compliment slips and for those who don't remember what a compliment slip was it was a piece of paper which had the company's name address and it all said with compliments on it and we had to get 50 compliment slips with 50 names and you would literally knock on doors. And I've been escorted from some of the finest offices in northern mill towns, I tell you. Um, you'd then on Tuesday get back to the office and you'd call those 50 people. And you would arrange um, meeting stroke demos for Wednesday. And the target was out of 50, you had to organize four to five demo stroke meetings for the next day. When you'd done that on Thursday, you were in the office, you would write proposals, and on Friday, you're expected to close one of those deals. Wow. Every week. Um, and that was, I hated it. I hated that stuff. I hated that, no, I didn't hate the job. I hated the cold calling, knocking on doors. You know, people, I mean, I'm, I am known for saying this, but when young SDRs or whatever say to me, oh, I don't really like cold calling, it's like, well, try it in the snow. <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. And we were never weather dependent. It didn't matter what the weather was. And you can imagine the Northwest, it got a bit miserable. You had to do it. Um, and, you know, it wasn't the best, it wasn't the most enjoyable thing to do. Best possible sales grounding you can ever get. I was hearing that. I was hearing that coming through. Once yeah. you start there, you've almost got you, you've done your yards, haven't you? You've got yeah. your respect. Yeah. So when I joined a company called Memorex in about 84, I guess, 
um, who were one of the bigger players in the IBM mainframe market. And I sold disc and tape, front end controllers, VDUs, printers um, into the biggest companies in the North. Um, I thought I'd made it. You know, I will never forget, you know, things that people take for granted. Now, I'm sorry to bang on about, you know, all our yesterdays, but. No, do it. I, lo I love how it's changed, honestly. I pulled up outside my house um, and I just got married and I phoned my wife and I said, she said, oh my God, are you still in the office? I went, no, I'm on the drive. She went, what? I'm on the drive. You can't be on the drive. You're on the phone. I'm on my car phone. <laughs> And uh, it was a hard-wired car phone. That big was it? So fantastic. I thought, I thought it was like the richest man in the world. Anyway, went through that. Um, did a good number of years at Memorex. Was very successful. Always finished. Always made club. Um, in the days when club, you didn't take your partner. So it was a different style of club. Um, it was basically five days drinking. Um, always made club. Got promoted to sales manager um then made it up to area manager um and then decided in the late 80s that i really wanted to get into the software business actually no early 90s um which was fledgling because when i started the only people selling software were ibm uh, in our space um and the main the mark, computer market was very much determined by the mainframe manufacturers so you either sold to ibm or you sold to icl users or you sold to debt users and typically those users because the investment was so big never move manufacturers they always stuck to one architecture um so ibm were the only people selling in our space then eventually the software industry started to develop um managed to get myself a job working for sterling software um actually running there so i'd got no channel experience no international experience and no software experience i ended up running their emir channel business for one product line well you must have had something else then uh yeah i got on really well with the evp that ran the um distributor division the, the partner division well there's a lesson for anyone who's listed isn't there relationships are key i remember having a fag a cigarette with her on the fire escape because there was no smoking in the office and she was the only one that ever did it and she went i need to go for a cigarette i don't suppose you smoke i went yeah i do she went uh, that'll do for me <laughs> and and actually that was invaluable because she, a lady called Gillian Perillo is retired now, lives in the States. Um, she was my first ever mentor, proper mentor. And Gillian and I are still in touch. Where are we? So that would have been like 92. Um, so we're almost 30 years on and Gillian and I are still in touch. And I still call her if I have a problem. If I have something I just can't get my head around, I know I'll call Gillian. And she's 70 now. She's had a massive effect then. Oh, she's got a respect there. Yeah, I'm a great, I'm a great believer in having mentors that, you know, you just trust. And um, yeah, so I had a career in the software business. The last kind of 20 years, um, I've been in leadership roles, typically running international businesses for American software companies. Um, and typically everything outside the Americas. So I've done a lot of travel, um, which we might touch on later, because that's something that's never going to happen again. I don't think people will ever travel on business the way we used to um you know i've done the two days in sydney one day in new york trips that go london in fact my only ever migraine london johannesburg singapore san francisco london six days um and that resulted in me getting a massive migraine in san francisco but anyway um so those leadership positions i've always been focused on growth that's what really excites me um, I like high growth businesses or struggling businesses that we can turn around. Um, I never, you know, I typically don't get hired into um, companies that are doing really well because um, that's not my forte. Steady state management is not my forte at all. I get bored. Um, so I like either early stage businesses that have got high growth potential or I like businesses that are established but flat and that are looking to find a way to grow. You're up, you, you like upping the stakes by the yeah. sound of it. You like a challenge. You've got quite a big pendulum, as they say, you know, you're willing to put up with that, but you know, really want the, the success at the other end. And yeah. you're happy with the, I suppose, the unstableness in between. Yes. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I've done most industries. Um, I've done a lot of different technology types. 
my absolute passion, believe it or not, is the real estate business, the commercial real estate business. So that started in when I was running Primavera's international business, who are now owned by Oracle. Uh, Primavera was probably the world's preeminent project management software, um, mainly into construction, large sales con construction, energy construction, um, et cetera. That kind of gave me the taste. Um, and I grew that business. Um, I kind of, I did blag my way into that because I didn't have any experience in that market. But um, we grew that business from 17 to $60 million of annual revenues in international in three and a half years. 17 to $60 million. In just over three years, yeah. How did you have good, was there a, a, a good prevailing wind behind you or? Um, I think there's always a bit of luck. There's always a bit of luck about being in the right place at the right time. But Primavera was a very established business. They were preeminent um, in their marketplace in that project management software space. Um, the international business was kind of a, a weird hybrid mix of channel and direct um, where they had channel conflict with the direct sales people all the classic channel problems um, they'd only ever had a sales manager before and I refused to join unless I was um, actually part of the senior leadership team because I knew international needed a voice um, so what I did there very simply was first of all I had a fantastic team um, that were really messed about by the US. Um, I worked for a fantastic CEO, the two founders, Joel Koppelman and Dick Farris, still in touch with now, certainly Dick, um, were willing to put faith in me to get on and do the job. Um, and had a fantastic team. I've always liked working with a strong number two and identified a guy called Dean Forbes. Um, Dean was 24, 25 at the time, was a channel sales guy, ended up running my entire channel business for me. I actually put him into my role when I left. Um, Dean has now built and exited three companies um, really well, including Salomon to American Express. Um, Core HR was his most recent. So Dean's made a lot of money, which I'm you know really proud that I could have some part. Um, as, his, as his mentor in those early days, did he cut you 50-50 on all those? On the... No, no, no. 100 no. zero. <laughs> um, he has been known to buy me the other nice bottle of champagne. I'm but, sure. Um, um, but Dean and I got really close. That was a massive benefit, and he's one of the most talented guys I've ever met. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to recognise that really early. Um, I remember the first one of the first things I did was go to a conference our European partner conference. I took every member of the team, it was my first day, round the car park. Just went for a walk around the car park of the hotel because it was a two-day event. And I remember meeting up with my CEO at the end of that day and he said, what do you think? I said, I found this guy who's going to be my number two and he's going to help me get this business big fast. And that was, that was luck. I didn't hire Dean, he was already there. That was luck. Um, anyway, left Primavera as the result of... Um, they got acquired by a PE firm that I didn't like. I was on the selection committee and was really anti this PE firm, which my no, bad decision on my part um, and left. Um, but I've done all sorts of things, but with this real estate business, I joined Argus about seven years ago, six, seven years ago. Argus uh, were the, one of the original prop tech companies before it was called prop tech um, selling, um, uh, valuation and financial modeling software into commercial real estate companies. I just fell in love with the business, not because it's the most interesting in the world, but if, I'm not a technician. I'm not a technical guy. Never have been. Um, you know, I've always argued that if you're sat in the dark working, I'm not going to sell you how electricity gets from a pylon to a substation, from a substation to the house, from the house to the light switch and from the light switch to the bulb. I'm going to sell you light. Yeah, and you the, don't know how you don't have to know how a TV remote control works. You just need to know where to point it and what exactly. buttons to press, don't you? Yeah, and the fact is, you need to solve the problem that the guy wants to turn the TV channels over without getting off his chair. And I can remember when you did have to get out of your chair to turn TV over. So, <laughs> um, them, them were days. Them were them were days. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, no, it's it's all changed. Yeah, and now I'm um, and now I'm with 
still in the property space, commercial real estate space, um, as CRO for a, an early stage business called Proda. Um, and without getting into you know a product pitch, I joined Pre Revenue. Um, so I think was when you and I first met. Yeah, it was. I'm interested to hear the next bit now. Yeah. yeah so we, I joined Pre Revenue. We launched the product Q3 last year, um, and we're now very post revenue. Um, we're starting to build out a team. Um, I'm on the exec team. Uh, work really closely with the two founders. Um, I think I'm seeing a little bit as you know the token grey-haired guy, yeah. um, but it's I love startups. Startups are so much fun, frustrating, hard work, but great fun. Yeah, I've done a couple of startups, and and one <clears throat> as we share passion in property. One was a group of estate agencies, and the next one is is obviously Wellity. And um, start startups are a world of their own, aren't they? Because you put in all this effort. Now we all know that effort equals reward, right? But you put it, there's a point before the tipping <coughs> where you are maximizing your effort. You're only got your sort of self-belief and inner critic of self-belief, inner critic, they're fighting each other. And you're, you've got nothing tangible to really show for it because maybe you haven't even launched the product yet, or maybe you're going through funny or whether you're really struggling to get that first customer, which then builds that momentum really slowly. Well, I mean, I knew you back, back when you were doing that right at the start. So talk us through just that, that the feeling of when it starts to get moving and that, that founder story, if you will, or that right at the start, the start. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you know, we are all naturally salespeople and salespeople are coin operated as we all know. And if you're going to do a startup from that stage, you have to be, yeah, there's a slot here. All co- I, just, all co- I just love, I have, I've heard a few phrases. I've never heard salespeople are coin operated. Of course they I are. Love that. love that. I'm writing um, that, I'm having that. Day. Put some money into them in the hope that lots more will come out the other side. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, anybody who's thinking about a startup career, pre-revenue has to accept that for three months, they're going to make no money over and above their salary, at least. So, you know, I joined quite late in quite late in the product development cycle because there's no need for a CRO when you've you're still developing product. I joined, and I thought our, you know, our founders were really smart. Get somebody into that role before we can sell, but so that you can do the groundwork, create the marketing, put the systems and processes in place. Um, but there is no better feeling in the world if you're a pre-revenue business when you do that first deal. The golden pound. It is. And it's the most important deal you'll ever do. Yeah. Um, because it's also the hardest deal you'll ever do. And it means you've got something that works. Yes. And if you've got a blueprint that someone's going to pay for, although you do have that slight imposter syndrome, you think, I bet it won't happen again. I think that was a bit of luck. We might have fluked that one. But when, it, yeah. when you do and you realize it works, it's the most exciting feeling in the world. And yeah. pat on your back. It is. It's an incredible feeling. And actually, you know, the one I've all, I'm always asked, what are the things that, what are the traits that salespeople have? And I think the one, and I've always believed, and if you le- read any of Neil Rackham's studies, the guy who invented spin, he'll tell you it doesn't matter whether salespeople are male, female, tall, short, fat, thin, blonde, brunette, or bald, um, black, white, green, or brown. It doesn't matter. Right? There's certain things that, that determine good salespeople. Um, and some of it's technical. You know, do you spend more time asking questions than answering than giving information out? That's fair. But the one trait I've always found is good salespeople love to close a deal. That's the buzz. Hunters. We all know, good salespeople know if they close enough deals, they're going to make a lot of money. So although we joke about salespeople being coin operated, yes, they are. But actually, I think the really good ones, it's the thrill that gets them. And, you know, I played semi-professional football when I was young. I was a goalkeeper. But I liken closing the first deal with Proda to winning the cup final. It's that kind of elation. Um, the first time you take it, um, the first time I presume that you take a drug, whether it be alcohol, whether is is the time where they say you've got a biggest hit and then that yeah. people build up a tolerance to that so effectively what we're saying is we're chasing that hit 
Yes. You know, it's almost a bit like addiction or a drug, isn't it? Isn't it? And then, then you get it and you're fueled by it. But that first one, the first time you do that and you realise, in this case at Broda, it works. It's an amazing feeling. Incredible feeling. And it makes it all worthwhile. Um, because you're right, you know, in that first three months prior to product launch, you know, there were lots of times I had doubts, you know, and it wasn't a doubt in the company. It wasn't a doubt in the people running the business. It wasn't a doubt in my colleagues. It was a doubt of, we don't know if this works. We know in a lab situation, in a proof of concept situation, this works. But do we know whether it really delivers long-term value for the customer? No. So, you know, to win that first deal, you actually need something that you don't often need in a sales cycle. You need a customer that is willing to make a bet on you. Yes. I'm, I'm writing down something here because with, with a startup, it's very easy because you've got the wheels being made over there. You've got the bonnet being made over there. You've got the website being made over there. You've got the product over there, the advertising, the client base, the data, the research. And you don't know what it's going to be like when it's all pulled together. It's, it's really scary. How do you know when to actually go to market? There's an argument that sometimes you should build the airplane in the air because only when you sort of go to market, you get all the feedback and keep doing that. With Prodom, did you get it all perfect? But nothing is perfect until you launch it, is it? How did you know when, when best to go to market? Because our two founders, and particularly Peter, the CEO, took a decision that we don't need a racing car to go to market. What you need is, you need a skateboard, and then a bicycle, and then a motorbike, and then a saloon car, and then a racing car. So how did we know? Actually, what I, one of the things I did was say, look, We've got a major industry event in October, uh, but there's like two major shows in the real estate, commercial real estate business. And one of them's called Expo Real in Munich. <clears throat> and I said, okay, let's set that as I go. Let's make Expo our target to launch because then we've got a ready-made audience. And that was what we worked towards. And did we launch a perfect product? No. Nope. <clears throat> did we launch a product that worked? Yes. Um, was it exactly where we wanted it to be? No. Will it ever be anywhere we want it, exactly where we want it to be? No. And if it does, then, you know, you've got a problem anyway. Yeah, because um, things are still changing. It always has to develop, doesn't it? Yes. And I'm a great believer in, I don't know if you've read Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset. No, but you I'm should. always open for it, yeah. Yeah, you should. Um, you know, her whole argument is with a fixed mindset and you think you can't learn, then you're, gonna, you're not going to succeed long term. Software is very much like that. You cannot ever think your software is good enough. Um, you know, it's a bit like a great sports coach. Pep Guardiola, because I'm a Manchester City fan, thought I'd get that in. Pep Guardiola, who I think is probably one of the best coaches of all time, one of his all-abiding philosophies is we always have to learn whether we win or lose. Um. And that's the culture he's instilled in all the clubs he's been at. And that's a growth mindset. <clears throat> it's interesting you say, because as salespeople over here, we'll come on to well-being in a minute as well. We, we still don't think that we need coaches. I bet Pep has got a life coach, a fight, someone looking after his finances, someone looking after various bits, his nutrition, everything else, in order to be the best version of himself. Yeah. And in order to keep sustainably having performance at an extremely high level. Now, I liken this to, with salespeople though, if we were, um, if we were a car, we'd be putting, we put the wrong fuel inside us, we drive for miles, we barely rest, and we're expected just to keep going on without any health checks, MOTs, anything. We're an extremely different beast, really, in the sales industry. I see it changing. Um, but from those early days when you were in sales, where there was really that booze, banter, and burnout, philosophy about behind sales do you see that changing at all i see a lot of changes um not necessarily all for the better um i see so when i started out there was a camaraderie whether i started out selling photocopiers or when i first moved into the computer industry some of it was the blind leading the blind i mean we we're all figuring it out together 
but I'm a great believer in team spirit. I'm a great believer in, you know, the team wins together and loses together. Um, and, you know, the companies I've been really successful at is where I've been able to build that mentality. So Primavera, we talked about, Argus, um, now at Proda, a couple of others. If you are lucky enough to build a team that gels and will back each other up, and will support and will act as each other's mentors. And you have an open dialogue about, look, I've got this deal and I'm really stuck. Um, and I know people talk about it. Oh yeah, we can all talk about deals and you know, let's help each other out. Nobody really does it. Um, I did encourage it. Um, and if you keep that fun and you keep that sense of support, I think that's a massive help. Mm -hmm. um, that's changed. I believe that's changed. I think there is, I think there's an even bigger drive towards numbers than there's ever been. And I think one of the benefits of COVID might be well-being really does come to the forefront. And we can talk about this in a little while, but you know, I've, I've said for a while, well-being today is a buzzword that's not being acted on. People saying, oh yeah, we're really concerned about the well-being of our team. Okay, show me what you're doing about it. And the investment you're making. What um, money? No, we've got fruit, slippers. But it doesn't even need to be big investment. This is a stupid thing, Simon. You know, I had one of my guys was struggling a couple of days ago. We hit a big problem. He wasn't getting the support he needed, um, which we dealt with. We fixed that. But at the end of the day, when I did my daily stand-up, I do a four o'clock with my direct reports every day. Um, he was clearly down. So when we finished it, I ordered him a pizza. Now, it costs, what, 15 quid? It's not a big investment. And you know, whether it comes out of expense or out of your own pocket, it's not a big investment. But the next day, you know, you could see it had had an impact. And particularly in the current environment where we are very isolated from each other. Um, and one of the things I'm struggling with in lockdown is I am a naturally social person. So I'm missing that personal interaction, even though I talk to the team all the time and I talk to my peers all the time. Just to think, oh, actually my boss actually does care. You know, it's and just... you're, you're summing up what well-being is. It's not the fact you've got to give, you know, it's not the fact that it's not pizza, but it's yogurt and fruit and lettuce and everything else. It's not. Nutrition is just a tiny part of well-being. The big part that you played there was was the self-esteem, the confidence, the you've got someone else, you've got that mentor, that's well-being, isn't it? That, that reassurance that we're yeah. all in this together. And I think, you know, even down to, um, you know, part of the, I mean, I did genuinely want Jack to cheer up. So I, so, <laughs> yeah. but in reality, you know, if that had been me, if I'd been sent that, and I'll give you an example, my, my boss has just sent me a dozen golf balls with Proda's logo on. Brilliant because he knows I'm a golfer. And we don't have golf balls with Proda's logo, and he's been out and had them done. Right? And that's, that's a phenomenal thing for him to do. Yeah. It's not cost him a lot of money. That's not the point. It's, uh, I know you're playing golf at the weekend. I know you've been you know, going through, you've been working hard, doing this, and this is just to say, I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, and can you leave a few in the clubhouse? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah. but you you made with business it, cards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with compliment slips. You made it to the top of his to-do list though, didn't you, one day? He, yes. he must have been very busy, but at some point he's got golf balls for David. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there is a lot of work we need to do on well-being, and there's a lot of work we need to think about burnout and we need to think about the stresses and strains we put on our teams. And particularly at the moment where you can't put your arm around somebody, you know, you can't anyway, cause it's an HR infringement, but you know what I mean? You can't, you can't, you know, just sit down with somebody for 15 minutes over a coffee and talk about them. Cause doing it on zoom, doing it on whatever we're on today, ring central or whatever it's called, yeah, by, zoom. Zoom, by the way, um, it's not the same. It isn't the same, you know, if you and I were now in a room doing this, you know, we'd be tactile. We would have shaken hands. We'd, yeah. you know, share a cup of coffee, we'd whatever, and we'd have a joke. And um, so this is different. Um, but I think 
you know, we've got to take time out to really understand what our teams are going through. And sales is one of the hardest to do because everybody gets driven by numbers. Why is sales different? Numbers. Why is sales so different? Just this obsession with numbers. You know, sales is one of the few jobs in the world that you can absolutely measure. Rightly or wrongly. I'm not saying it's right. Yeah. But you can absolutely, I could, you know, work with you and say, Simon's not successful because he's only at 62% of his target. Or Simon's a fantastic sales guy because he's 200% of his target. No, it'd have been the first one. Neither of which are true, by the way. Neither of which are true. Because there's factors for both. And, um, but it, because of that binary nature of the measurement system, um, salespeople are naturally have to strive to achieve this at target every single day of their lives. And do you know what it is? I think is that when you get to the end of the month, when you start the new month or the quarter or the half, whatever you're measuring on, you literally on all of your performance on all your track record, you got to, yeah, you wipe it off. Yeah. I don't know another industry where you just get rid of all your back catalog and have to start again, being judged on um, you are that month. the only industry I can think of that's like that is professional sport. Yeah. Where you're judged on your last result. Um, you know, if you're a professional golfer and you were world number one last year and Luke Donald's a good example, if you know much about golf, Luke Donald was world number one for 51 weeks, I think, and then lost form and ended up dropping out of the world's top 200 for a while wow. and was forgotten. Now, Luke Donald's not become a bad, um, Luke Donald's not become a, a bad golfer. He's just hit a period of bad form. But he was forgotten. And I read this great piece that he lost nearly all his sponsors. And if, you, if you're a professional golfer and you lose your sponsors and you're not winning tournaments, you're making no money. Yeah, and your kudos um, and your merit and your self-esteem and everything else that goes yeah. with it. And then you get all the issues that go with it. So, and I think sales is very similar. Sales, you're as good as your last quarter or your last year if you're an annually measured business or your last month or in some businesses, your last week. Um, David, we are um, at risk in this conversation around well-being for, for big sales leaders, uh, of which you are one, to, to say, look, come on, guys. I know well-being's great and all that, but it's a bit fluffy. And I can't go to my shareholders meeting, slap down on the desk a well-being policy and say, there you go. You can all go back happy now. Because it doesn't, it doesn't cut it with them. They want facts, figures, growth. Let's face it, that's what they want. So the, the topic is around well-being. It's not just for the sake of well-being, because it's a subject. It, it helps the bottom line, doesn't it? It increases Absolutely. longevity of sales. How would you get that message across? It is challenging. And I think there's been a shift towards it now. I think there is a, a trend towards an acceptance at the board level that well-being is important. Um, I think, as I said earlier, a lot of people are still paying lip service to it almost as a, it's a bit like their environmental policy. You know, all right, we've got to have an environmental policy to tick a box. Mm. Fine. We'll have an environmental policy. Yeah. But what impact is that having? Well, it doesn't matter. I've got to tick in the box. Yeah. Put it in the drawer. And it's the same with well-being. However, the issue, or well, not the issue, the benefit of having a good well-being process, and Proda, we don't have one today because we're too young, we're still working on it, but the benefit of having a good well-being process and program is it's proven you will get better performance. You absolutely will get better performance. One of the things that I think will come out of the COVID crisis, because there's now going to be a shift away from five days in the office, I think people will naturally strike a better work-life balance, and mine's terrible, and that's my fault, it's not anybody else's. Um, will strike a better balance, which means people are in a better position, mental health-wise, and, and well-being-wise, and physically, and nutritionally, and um, that we will see a positive impact on the bottom line. So if I look at, look at where we are today, you know, I've been sat in this room for 12 weeks, effectively. However, I'm eating more sensibly. Mm -hmm. I'm exercising better. Um, I'm getting more fresh air. Um, 
I'm not getting up at 5 a.m. to get a 6 a.m. train. So inevitably, my sleep is better. Um, yes, I got to bed a bit later, but, you know, I'm actually, and I'm actually working harder than I've ever worked, I think, because I don't, you know, waste loads of the day. You know, I don't waste four hours commuting for a start. Um, I don't waste time walking out to get a coffee and having to walk by the river. Um, I don't spend, I don't have an hour for lunch anymore. I probably have 20 minutes. Well, I know how much you had, yeah, because it was just before this, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. I'm shoveling it down as fast as I can. That's right. But I'm not snacking during the day. You know, all those things contribute. So actually, health-wise, I'm probably in a better position. Um, I'm drinking a little more, but that's just because I think everybody's drinking a little more. That's lockdown. Yes, that's lockdown. That's not working from home. That's just lockdown. Um, We've got to keep the conversation real, haven't we? I mean, you yes. can't give up every vice. You can't do everything. What we're trying to say is it's it's progression, not perfection. Yes. It's better okay. every day. You can only manage what you do. It, well, well, it is not about giving everything up. It's about having one eye on Yes, on your health. Some balance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But if I come back to your original question, because we got diverted again, but the question was, you know, how do you make well-being part of the agenda in a way that's meaningful to investors and shareholders? Correct. The way you do that, and it is about measuring the before and after effect, but does it improve productivity? I firmly believe it will. Um, I believe it will reduce mental health issues. I believe it will improve people's overall physical health. Um, and I believe it will allow people to get more balance into their lives. Um, you know, you and I are in a similar position without getting too personal, but we've been through divorces and breakups probably caused, certainly my first one was, was caused by work. You know, I spent, and one of the, one of the great regrets in my life is I, I doubtly saw the first four years of my son's life because I was traveling the world working. Actually, when I was at Primavera, funnily enough, but um, I was traveling the world and, you know, I had no balance in my life. I would go start traveling on a Monday, come back on a Thursday or a Friday, get clothes washed, pack the bag and fly out again on Sunday night or Monday morning. That's not a balance. Mm -hmm. And I know, and that's not because I'm a, you know, a martyr or a special case. I knew thousands of people like that. And, and it isn't just your life that gets affected it's everybody around you um you know one of the things as we've already touched on you know people aren't going to travel on business as much um they're not going to work in the office five days a week that will put more balance into their life mm. and, um, and, you're, and you're right it's an addiction and with every addiction comes a hangover yes and with every addiction comes the effect of everyone else having to either fall in line or go their own way um or try so what and you help. do is i think use that to prove the effect um we're still busy we're still in businesses at the end of the day and yeah. i know a lot of people don't like me to say this but businesses are only in in business for one reason and that's to make profit yeah they're only there to make money otherwise you wouldn't do it i'd play golf all day or that's I'd right. play my guitar all day um so if you can prove if and, and there is data starting to come through now but the more data we have that says Good well-being within the workplace promotes productivity. Product, you know, extra productivity means extra efficiency, means ultimately more profit. Yeah. You know, you're going to get more value from those assets if you see people as assets, which a lot of boards do. Um, and I think, you know, as you touched on earlier, if we can keep employees happy for longer, keep them in position and performing successfully, for the minimal cost that well-being is going to involve, then how can it be anything other than a positive thing? Exactly. And normalize the conversation around well-being and mental health so that they don't have to run off and finish their career and find something else because they just can't carry on the way they were in that industry. Why don't we become a bit more adaptive? Now, look, David, I know that we're both um, fans of like well-being in the workplace brought out of uh, mental health. Um, and some of the trials and tribulations that we, as well as every real leader, um, has had. Um, there's one frustration with, that, you've, that you have, which is the mention of well-being, but there isn't a system behind it to back it up. I yeah. mean, was, was there ever been a, um, has there, and has there ever been a time in your life where you've had to face resilient, should we say? Yeah, there has, and you know, this is, 
I guess this is something that five years ago I would never have admitted. Being a gruff, tough northerner, you know, men just sucked it up and carried on. Um, you know, I, I recognise I had probably, I've had mental health issues and I treat mental health or I view mental health as, you know, kind of like flu for the mind, you know. But when I, when I look back and I realise I first had mental issues, mental health issues 15 years ago maybe, um, at the break of my first marriage, at th that time you kind of just got on with it. It was seen as a sign of weakness, um, particularly in men. Men's mental health was a real stigma. And, you know, the first time I, when I look back and recognise, the first time I saw it, you know, I just tried to deal with myself without telling anybody. Um, and that was a mistake. But we all have traumas in our life. Some are big, some are small. Sometimes they all come up once and they're overwhelming. Um, and sometimes people can deal with them without any real impact. Um, I'm not one of those people. Now, I, I know that now. Um, I'm one of those people that does get affected. And I have had periods of depression. And I've had periods of real darkness. Um, but now I recognize it. And now I can do something about it. I'm really fortunate in the... I've got some really good friends. I don't have a lot of really good friends. I've got lots and lots of acquaintances, probably the same as you, Simon, but only a very small handful of really good friends. Trusted friends, yeah. And they, they get it. You know, I've got, I've got one friend that throughout the whole of this lockdown, we've had a beer at seven o'clock every night and we've just talked. And, you know, his first question to me has always been, how are you today? And he means it. And, and what happened then? Because I know when I went through my time, which again we're normalizing the conversation um it wasn't it's exactly like you just said it wasn't just one it wasn't just two it was three four five yeah. all at the same time and and in my um in my coaching since then you are meant to look around you see if you're safe right i think yeah. i was safe but then you're, you're also looking for evidence that what your inner critic is saying isn't true but when you're like that and you're getting three four and five punching you in the nose Everything around you is true. It is confirming what you are. That, that, that was for me when I knew I was on the slippery slope down. Yeah. And I think it's that... I'm like you, Simon. I'm outwardly a very confident, positive person. Inwardly, not so much at times. And I think, you know, recognising that actually this is getting overwhelming. I need to talk to somebody. And I am, I'm an extrovert in the, the scientific um, measurement of, a, of an extrovert. If you look at Myers-Briggs, I need to process information externally. Uh, if I start internalizing stuff, it just gets worse. Um, you know, and I went through a phase where I was scared to go to bed because I would lie in bed, stare at the ceiling and really internalize and get really black. And that's horrible. Uh, and you do feel lost and you do feel desolate and you do feel like I don't know where to turn. I've now learned that I have to externalize that and I've got people I can talk to. Um, whether it's a couple of very close friends or whether it's medical help or, uh, you know, even the therapy, which I've done, tried. And it's the problem I have with therapy is it's hard finding the right therapist. It's going to be somebody you connect with. Um, but yeah, I went through a phase where I had... You know, I, I was divorced. Um, I'd lost a job. Uh, my son was having serious problems. Um, my, I'd lost my dad. Um, and it was just, this isn't that long ago. And it was just, I don't know where to turn. This is all too much. And I think I was lucky in some ways because I'd seen the symptoms previously and done some research myself into what the hell's wrong with me. Um, I then thought, you know what? I know there's a li still a little bit of stigma about men's mental health, but screw it. I've got to get this off my chest. How bad was it at the time? What was, what was your, with me, I always start with me, and that's not to talk about me, it's just because to gain some trust and authenticity in our conversation. Um, to me, it was self-esteem. I was working remotely, really. I was working on my own all the time. Inner critic was so loud and nauseous, it was driving me mad just because 
you know there are experiences in your life when you've been better than this. And I felt like I was on the floor with a foot on my chest. Mm -hmm. like, like, other people talk about it being at the bottom of a well, a slippery well that you can't get up through, but you can hear the muffled noise of everyone else carrying on their lives at the top. For me, it was uh, lying on the floor. I don't know why I'm going, but with a foot on my chest that I knew I could get up. I just couldn't. There was something stopping me. How, what was it for you? For me, it was almost fetal. I just felt like I was curled up in a ball and, and didn't dare emerge from that ball. Mm. Um, and it manifests itself in lots of ways. Um, so one of the ways is I'm lucky. I live in a really beautiful little village in the Cotswolds, but I've got lots of friends all over the, the area. For about nine months, I pretty much, apart from work and playing gigs, I didn't go out of the village because I didn't feel safe anywhere else. Um, so it was a massive sense of insecurity. Um, there was a massive sense of failure. Um, failure, I felt like I'd failed my son, myself, my family. Um, that was, and that's not you know, a natural state for me. Um, so that was, that was really oppressive. And as I said, it led to things like I didn't want to go to bed because I'd stare at the ceiling. And then the thoughts would get really bad. And, you know, fortunately, I was trying to drag myself back from the worst of it. But How bad did they get? As bad as, they, as bad as they can get. Oh, dear. Right. Um, and, you know, never did anything about it, but that was the thought process. Um, and that was tough, you know. And then, you know, I started getting help from doctors and therapists and, and a couple of really good friends that I'm indebted to forever um, who continue to support me. But the interesting, the more I talked about it, the more I found out how many other people had the same problem. Because you'll know from your situation, Sam, when you're in it, you don't think anybody else has got that problem. Yeah, well, the thing is, I used to look at anxiety as like a bully because it just relied on me being quiet. And, it, and then it used to not tell anyone, and that used to give it powers. Like any bully wants to keep it under the radar. But then it would also say, go on, have a drink, have a drink, take the edge off. So I'd have a drink and then it would come and beat me up the next morning. So actually it was really chipping away. And, and what it was is that um, shame gets stronger in silence. And the thing, with, the thing with me, there was no real actual shame. I hadn't done anything wrong. It was just a series of events that were coming in. And what you've alluded to then are things that we put ourselves under so much pressure. And it may be that, I don't know whether it's about sales, but we've got to be up there all the time. And so we start there and we have to raise ourselves each day to get to that point. It's like going on, on the football pitch all the time. And up in a, but when you're down here, the golf is not just to be normal, but the golf to exit is so big that there are times when you think, I just can't do it. I just, and, and I'm not saying that's, that's all the time. I'm saying if anyone is going through a bad period in their life, a tranche in their life, where they're like that, recognize it. And some of the things you were saying about guilt, anxiety, and at those lowest points, it's so easy to compare yourself with people. And that was the worst thing you could do because A, you should never compare because you're on a losing battle straight away. And B, you, you, everyone's at different times in their lives. Mm. And, and this, what we're describing, if it hasn't happened to people, I'm very happy it hasn't happened to them, but it could happen to anyone at any time, bearing in mind we're talking about death, divorce, debt, anything, and circumstances, as we know with COVID, that can be outside of our control. Yeah, and I think when I mean, you mentioned COVID, you know, one of the, one of the knock-on effects from this whole crisis that I'm really concerned about is the impact on the world's mental health. Because this isn't a UK problem, it isn't a US problem, it's a global problem. And, um, you know, there is going to be an impact. There are people that are lonelier than they've ever been in their lives right now. There are people that are financially struggling, possibly for, for many, for the first time in their lives. Yeah. And, you know, we've got to help people cope with that. Um, I know we've got members of our team that are quite lonely because they're living alone in flats in London. Um, they don't have the benefits that I have of living in the countryside where you can get out and walk, or in my case, go and play golf or go fishing or do whatever. Um, but, and I would absolutely encourage anybody that's listening to this to just reach out to somebody, reach out to somebody you trust or reach out to somebody who's professional you don't know. 
because those are kind of the two people that you can quite often talk to. Somebody you've got no emotional tie to, who aren't going to judge you, or somebody you trust so much that you can absolutely trust them and you know they will listen and give you good feedback. Yeah, this is so, so hard to talk, I think, is what people are saying at work, because you've got this game face at work all the time. You then, all that, all that career, you have to then unwind your game face to let people know what you're really like. And then are they going to treat me like that all the time or do I have to wind my game face up again? Yeah, and exactly. when we come out of COVID, there will be a hangover because, you know, everyone who's been furloughed, suddenly will a lot of people be made redundant when the 80% yes. goes. Um, will there be that horrible Sunday night feeling when people have to go to Sunday night blues when people have got to go to work on the Monday? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a real challenge for people. And, and, you know, I was reminded of this um, the other day. There's a, a, a lady um, down the road from us who's quite old and we've been doing a bit of shopping for and helping her out, my wife has mainly. And uh, I took some stuff around us the other day and she said, you know, people have never seen this before. There's a generation that lived through the war, Second World War, that know what this is like. And they've seen it before, but 90% of the population of the world have never seen this before. Well, certainly the Western world. I mean, I guess if you're in a, you know, if you're in a third world developing country where you've lived through poverty and civil war, etc., yes, you've seen it. But in the developed world, in the UK or France or Germany or the US or Australia or New Zealand, never seen it. So actually, we don't have coping mechanisms because we've never been here. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things in this, but this isn't meant as a political comment, is, you know, the government of all the countries of the world have been getting huge amounts of abuse for the way they've handled the crisis. And, you know, I've said to everybody, there is no manual for this because we haven't seen it before. And it's the same with individuals and the way they cope with it mentally um, is... They've got no frame of reference. There's no point to anchor it back to. Mm. Now, most of the things I do in my career, before I make a decision, I'll kind of, it, subconsciously, I'll tie that back to something that's happened in the past that's similar. Okay, what happened then? What did I do and, and what was the outcome? Do I change it? Do I do the same? There is no frame of reference. So, um, you know, it's hard to know what to do for the best. Mm. Um, but, they, you know... The point I would make is anybody watching this, reach out to someone because there is no stigma to mental health. There is no stigma to not being okay. Um, you know, it's a very common phrase now. It's okay to not be okay, but it's absolutely true. It's not okay to not do anything about it. You, know, you need to get support. You need to get help. You need to talk to Wellity or you need to talk to your doctor or you need to talk to a trusted friend or you need to talk to a family member which is hard none yeah. of my family knew i was ill none i don't think you realize how inspirational this conversation is at wellity we want to it's very you don't preach to people because if you start preaching to people the shutters come in so what we want to do is ask them to digest some of this content to allow them to see that everyone else is in the same boat you know we're in what is it we're in different boats but we're in the same storm and um and that way they can hear what you're saying, see there's a light at the end of the tunnel and realize that there is no stigma because we've all got mental health. So, you know, it's, you, everyone should be able to talk about it. So it's really good what you're doing um, in being so normal about this conversation. Um, well, it comes back to what I said earlier. If, if you have flu, you will go to the doctor without thinking about it. And nobody's going to judge you for having flu think about mental health and well-being in the same way treat it exactly the same mm. um you know people know that i've had challenges my friends know because i've told them because now i'm not embarrassed by it now i accept it's an illness that you know is likely to come back at some point you know like the flu and i'll go get it treated again um you know, and the fact is, with all mental health issues, they're all treatable or manageable, even the worst kinds. You know, even people that are seriously mentally ill that might have schizophrenia or paranoia or all these things, 
they might not be curable, but they're certainly manageable. Yeah. You know, and my argument um, is t 15 years ago, AIDS had a terrible stigma to it. And if you had AIDS, you were shunned and you were almost like a leper. Now, nobody bats an eyelid mm. because it's manageable. You know, I actually have a friend who's HIV positive. But he's had it for 10, 15 years. Um, he'll tell people. He doesn't care. There's no stigma attached to it. Why should mental health be any different? It should um, be. It shouldn't. It should. and I think it increasingly it isn't, but it has been for a long time. Yeah. And particularly amongst men. Um, you know, it was always seen as a sign of weakness. I think it's getting much better. But I think, you know, if you come back to the point about the corporate world, companies have to be cognizant of it. And, you know, I don't think many companies really are. I know some CEOs that are. I know some CEOs that kind of pay at lip service. I know some CEOs that aren't really bothered. And talking of CEOs, I think it does start at the top, right? I mean, they, you do have to take one for the team because culture goes down. Um, and I, I think it was the CEO of Lloyd's who came out and talked about his depression and their absenteeism as a group went down 10%. Yeah. Um, because the conversation was easy to talk about. Well, 10% less absenteeism, that's not bad. An environment where everyone can talk and be a bit more honest. You know, what else are we going to uncover that could increase performance? I mean, it was fantastic. Yeah, agreed. And we should encourage that. We should keep that dialogue open. Um, yeah. And I hope we can do. And I hope people pay attention to it. And, you know, I think what Wellity are trying to achieve is phenomenal. It's a great Thank you. step forward. Um, and that's why I was more than happy to come on and do this with you. And I've, you know, probably opened up even more than I intended to. Um, I haven't cried, which is good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've not finished. That's, yeah. <laughs> I've got too long left, but I should yeah. be okay. Um, but I think people need to pay attention to it. And it isn't, as you said earlier, it isn't just about having yogurt and fruit in the office. It isn't just about having a team event once every month. It's about showing empathy for the team and caring about the team and letting the team know you care about them and being open to listening to them. Um, and that for me, if we can get to that point, even without the, the fruit and the running clubs and the social events, if you could just do that, well-being in the workplace would be 10 times better. Thank you, David. This is so appreciated. And it, and it really is an appreciation that we're all, all normal. We can still strive to hit our number and quota. Now, I know there's this one person that likes to hit his number. It's you. Um, yep. and, and, and as you're in startups all the time, I mean, you really are in the trenches uh, and building it up. I mean, you're, a, you're an incredible leader. Um, it's Thank just you. that, well, no, it's my pleasure. And, but you're a really nice bloke as well. And I know when we've met on the circuit as well, you, you always had time for us. And I think we likened it to the 12 o'clock club when, you know, us, us blokes were sitting around and it was only after a few beers that the conversation just went to the pressures and life and everything else. And, you know, there was a good seven or eight of us that bonded that night and that those conversations will remain private. Um, but I haven't forgotten. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I haven't forgotten um, how open you were and, um, it encouraged others to do likewise. So look, I'd just like to really thank you, thank you for your time. Um, it's been, been so, so kind of you and nice and, and will inspire others. My last wrap up question would, and I think I know what you're gonna say from what you said before, well, there's two. What is your definition of well-being? And we'll start with that one. And then if you could give one person one takeaway from your experience in life and business, what would it be? So we'll start with, what is your definition of well-being? Okay. Um, I've never really thought about it, so I'm going to have to think quickly on my feet now. Uh, my definition of well-being is being comfortable in your own skin in all the situations you find yourself in. Brilliant. Because um, then you could do anything to anyone, can't you? Sorry? Well, because then you're yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we all have times when we're not. Um, the advice I would give everybody, both in life whether it's life or business is I'm going to need more than one piece of advice and um, be true to yourself. Don't wear the mask too often. Um, secondly, give yourself an outlet. So I have two outlets, 
Um, one's my grandchildren, um, and the other one's music. You know, I play, as you know, I play in a band, I play solo, I've been playing gigs in my garden during COVID. Um, but I can forget about everything when I'm playing music, um, particularly when I'm playing live. And same with my grandchildren, you know, you focus on them, you don't focus on anything else because they're my grandchildren are both under four, so they don't allow it. Um, so give yourself an outlet to give yourself a break. And finally, please talk to somebody. Be open. Don't bottle stuff up, whether it's work pressure, whether it's the fact you're worried you're not going to hit your number this month. Um, and I've always told salespeople throughout my career, tell me bad news at the start of the month, not the end, because trust me, the repercussions are much nicer. Um, but just be willing to talk. Don't yeah. try and struggle with it all yourself. It's not worth it. So I think your takeaway, your main takeaway is it's, you know, it's good to talk um, and a problem shared. Um, yeah. look, David, um, where can people find you? Your story will resonate with many and they may not want to go publicly with their, with their own, but they may just want to drop you a line. How can they get hold of you? Probably the easiest way without me giving away personal email addresses because yeah. there's about the recruiters watching this. Um, and I get enough calls from them as it is. Um, yeah, get me on LinkedIn. It's David Oates, easy to find. Um, drop me a message on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time. Um, so yeah, drop me a message on LinkedIn or contact you. Yeah, great. And we will upload this to our Wellity platform, which will be going into the, the sales networks and which will encourage people to open the conversation around mental health and well-being in a bid to inspire others to, um, with anyone facing adversity, just to help them through and obviously, and then push forward and, and succeed in whatever they want to do. So David Oates, I can't thank you enough. I very, very, very much look forward to actually being able to meet up with you again and maybe share a couple of ciders watching you play some music. Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll talk to you really soon. Thank you, mate. Okay.